as you can see, I'm from the Department of Surgery at Duke. That we're in medicine and we're interested in health and how your body works and making it more healthy. So evolution plays a big role in that and understanding how evolution works plays a big role in medicine. And I think Charlie Nunn, who's, he's here, he's the director for the Triangle Center for Evolutionary Medicine. So we're interested in how Darwin's theories affect what's going on in medicine. One of the main things that I work on is worms in our body. And I'll explain to you why we're interested in worms in the next slide. So it turns out that Americans are very unhealthy. And there's so many reasons why we're unhealthy. It turns out that if you're under the age of 18, there's almost, well, a little more than four in 10, 43% of children in the United States are on medications for some kind of chronic condition, some kind of medical condition. Most of these medical conditions involve something called inflammation. All right, that's very important to understand that if you're, you have an allergy or you have an autoimmune disease or even something like a migraine headaches and depression and ADHD and autism are all connected with inflammation, which is your immune system being hyperreactive. We could just think of it as that it's a little bit more complicated, but not much, really. It's just your immune system is kind of paranoid and crazy and is doing things it shouldn't do. For example, with hay fever, your immune system tends to react with ragweed pollen or other kinds of pollen. So I've got a little pointer here. You can see it's a tiny little pointer, but everything from depression, migraine headaches, anxiety disorders, even cancer is associated with inflammation. And, and the next question is, why are we so sick? Well, it turns out we actually, scientists know why we're so sick. And I'm gonna show you, I think, on the next slide. So the idea here is it, it used to be, there's a list of five things, okay? We call them the big five that make us sick in the United States and Europe and people from developing countries, they start getting sick about five years after they immigrate to a Western country. So one of those five, and the one I'm going to talk about mostly today, used to be called the hygiene hypothesis. Have you heard, you know, we're so clean that our immune systems, they're not getting stimulated enough? Well, it, it turns out that it, it, hygiene hypothesis is an old term. It was developed by a fellow back in the late 70s, early 80s, and it's not exactly accurate. Now, in fact, if you stop taking a bath from now until the day you die, first of all, it'd be, guys, it would be really hard to get a date. It'd be tough, and it wouldn't actually help your immune system, okay? You just, you would smell bad. Although there's, there's a theory out there that after a certain amount, number of months, you would stop smelling bad. You, your, your, um, your microbiota, the little bacteria on your body would sort of normalize back to what they were before we developed soap and showers, and then you would stop smelling. But I. I wouldn't recommend doing that experiment. You could try it though, some people have. The point here is that it's not about hygiene, it's about other things that we'll talk about on the next slide. Before I go to that though, I wanna point out that there are inflammatory diets, and I'm just gonna skim over this, but we eat a lot of processed foods, high in fat, and we don't exercise, and we have a lot of stress compared to a caveman. It's a certain kind of stress, it's called chronic stress, it just goes on and on and on. Whereas a caveman would have probably, or cave woman would have had some stress that we call acute, it would have happened right away and then it would have been gone. And then finally, because we work inside, everybody should get their vitamin D checked, especially if you have dark skin, especially if you work indoors all the time, then vitamin D deficiency, it turns out, is a big problem when it comes to your immune system being paranoid and causing all these problems that you remember we talked about on the first slide. All right, so here we go. What are we doing to, this is called our biota. It's all, so the microbiota, or the microbiome, those are all the tiny little organisms inside us, right, but there's, bigger organisms, and we're gonna talk about those today. And, and just remind me at the end of the talk, I've, I'm probably gonna forget, but I've actually brought some big organisms to show you. So, especially kids, these are pretty cool. 
little organisms and they have some cool effects and they, they've set me up a camera so I can show you. So it turns out that because of modern society, we pretty much lost all our worms. We humans, until probably about 1910, 1920 or so, which is when they invented a toilet that wouldn't explode. You know, you had before then you had to pretty much use an outhouse and nobody had soap in regular use. You couldn't use it all the time because you had to have hot water for soap to really work effectively back in those days. Our soap today is different. It works with cold water pretty well. But back in those days, if you, you could just, it was a problem. So most people didn't use soap, they didn't have toilets, and you had lots of worms running around everywhere. And worms can cause problems, and they, they got a really bad reputation because of toilets, because of clean drinking water, because in fact I wear shoes, and we're all wearing shoes, those kinds of things get rid of our worms. And if you have questions about that, you can ask me uh, when the talk is over. There's time for questions at the end of the talk. So we did lose all of our worms. It turns out the worms are really one of the main things that trains our immune system. Okay, now we also lost some bacteria. Um, for example, bacteria in the soil are probably really good for us. Some of the bacteria in the soil and we probably had those bacteria all over our skin. We don't have those anymore. There's a Canadian company that sells a product that's called, it's called Mother Dirt, and it's actually dirt bacteria that you spray on you, and people that spray that on themselves, they don't have to use deodorant nearly as much. Okay, and the product does work. I've tried it, it's kind of fun. It doesn't smell, it doesn't look like dirt. It's just a clear liquid, it's an interest, and I'm, I don't have any financial interest, no conflicts of interest. It's just interesting things that I like to investigate. And then one of the things that we've got now is a lot more bad germs. In fact, almost everything that you get immunized against is a so-called a crowd infection. It's because we live in a very crowded society compared to our hunter-gatherer, or you could call them cave people ancestors. So we need our hygiene and vaccinations, we need those to keep these kinds of bad germs down. All right, so washing your hands is good. If I don't wash my hands, if I don't take a shower, again, I won't pick up a worm that I really need, and I won't even get more good germs. I'll just probably pick up a lot more bad germs. So it's, it's not about hygiene. It's more about trying to figure out what we've lost and how to put it back in. That's what I'm gonna talk to you about, is how we do that. So I think first I, I'm going to show you some pictures of some bacteria inside the intestine, inside your gut. So this is a picture, and you see my tiny little red pointer here. This is inside a frog, and right here with these big yellow spots, that's actually the frog's gut. This is a slide. We took a little section of the frog gut and we stained it with a chemical called acridine orange that makes everything glow, depending on what it is. And you can see that the frog gut is here and then there's these tiny little speckly things right along, and the two arrows point in between what the frog gut, and these are called biofilms. And there's a whole exhibit on bacteria and biofilms. It's up in the museum. It's a very interesting exhibit. It talks about how bacteria live in these films. It's literally a living, biofilm means a living film. It's, a, it's literally a colony of bacteria that grow as a single organism in our gut. And our immune system spends a lot of time cultivating them. So our immune system is actually helping the bacteria to grow in our gut. And now, up until about 1990, 1994, we all thought that the immune system was constantly fighting against the bacteria in the gut, and it turns out it's just not true. So here, in fact, this is a human gut, and you're looking at the appendix here. The, it's called the vermiform, which is Latin, I think, for worm-like appendix. And appendix means just, it's an attachment, something on the side. And then this is the large intestine, this is the ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid colon. 
if you look inside the appendix, you see these little, once again, same picture in the frog, except this is in the human. You see these tiny little speckles where my laser pointer is. And those are the little, each little speckle is a bacteria and the whole thing together is a film. And then these are the human cells here that are on the appendix. And every now and then a patient goes in and they're having some other kind of surgery and they get their appendix taken out we can get the appendix tissue and look at it. It's a little bit easier to get tissue from frogs, but we can get the tissue from humans. But the bottom line is that yes, our appendix is here and th this allowed us several years ago to figure out that the appendix is really a safe house for bacteria. And now we know if you're missing your appendix, it can cause some problems down the road, but still you have to get your appendix taken out if you get appendicitis. So I'm gonna tell you how you know if you have appendicitis, if you don't get it taken out, you have a 50% chance of death. Okay, I've heard death is not good. It's to be avoided if you can. So this is how you tell. You put your thumb, your, it has to be your right thumb. So it's on this side, you put it on your belly button, just like this. And then you lay your hand just like that. Okay, and right at the end of your pinky, right there. If it starts to hurt right there a lot, especially if it's starting to hurt and you push in and then let go and it really hurts, that probably means you have appendicitis. I was working with some Boy Scouts one time and one of the guys got appendicitis and you knew immediately, oh, you gotta go to the doctor. And sure enough, he had appendicitis. They make one little cut, take it out, and it's no problem. But he's sort of missing this safe house for bacteria, so, you know, he's got to Take that into account later on if you use antibiotics or something like that. So if you have, again, if you have any questions, you can ask me at the end. But this, this is all about a worm-like organ that evolution has put in our bodies. And if Charles Darwin thought it was actually a leftover from evolution, but we, you know, his theories have advanced substantially, and we've been working with a team of evolutionary biologists, and we figured out that. Well, okay, that, if he had known what we know now, he would not have thought that it was a leftover. We sort of know what it does, and we know how it functions, and we have a much better understanding of it. So back to this, let's, let's think about these worms just a little bit, because, well, there's, there's a lot going on here, right? There's the bacteria that have changed, there's the worms that have been completely annihilated. So everybody's heard how important your bacteria is for health. So which one is the most important? It turns out, if you compare our bacteria, now this is, Jeffrey Gordon did this work, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time showing data, so kids don't get too bored, but what this says is that if you compare our bacteria, the people, if you look inside your intestine, and you look at the bacteria in there, and that's what they did in this study, they're looking at poop bacteria, but it's similar to the bacteria that are inside the gut. And you compare those bacteria to somebody who's living, it's, it's called pre-industrial, but they live like back in the old days in either South America and Africa. What you see is the bacteria, and this is a measure of the number of different kinds of bacteria. If you have questions about this, you can ask me later. We do, they're complicated studies, but they're, they're fairly simple to understand. What you see is that in the United States, and this is a, uh, a South American and African tribe of people that live in a time, and well, they, they live in the present day, but they live before in industry. The number and type of bacteria is about the same, and in fact, the, really the major difference is just the diet. So if we change our diet to be like the diet before we got sodas and before we got honey buns and all the kinds of interesting things that we have, including white bread, then our bacteria go back to sort of being normal. Now, it turns out that bacteria are important for our health. And this is, this is uh, important, I think, to understand that once your body gets inflamed, right? In other words, your immune system starts going nuts, it can actually change your bacteria. So the bacteria evolve. Now, this is kind of a so you have, if you have a healthy person, so if you're healthy, your parents are healthy, your bacteria are healthy, everything's healthy, but then let's say something happens, you're vitamin D deficient and you 
you know, your worms aren't there anymore and you get stressed a lot and you're eating a horrible diet. So you can get, say something happens and you start getting a digestive problem. Well, then your bacteria really don't know what to do. They're, this is not their normal place to be, right? What happens then is over time, and we've done these kinds of experiments in the lab, it takes the bacteria, they'll start changing pretty quick. But within a year or two, and I'm not going to show you a lot of data, you can ask me, you know, we have lots and lots and lots and lots of boring publications that it, it takes days to read. But what happens is eventually then the bacteria can actually change. And once they change, then they become happy in that what we think of as a bad environment, and then they sort of, they can hold things back. And this was worked out, um, it's been worked out in obesity, and there's a couple of professors at UNC who are working on this with inflammatory bowel disease. But the bottom line is that this can, once you get these in your body, they can sort of impede things. So bacteria can be very important, and they're starting to do things like called a poop transplant, right, or a fecal transplant to transplant healthy poop back into sick people to see what kind of effects they can have. But I, I really want to get back to our worms here. That's the title of the talk. And they, to me, they're a lot more interesting. And I'm going to show you on this slide what a worm can do. What, a, what can a worm do for you? So in Argentina, back in about 2004, 2005, they did this study published in 2007. They had a whole bunch of people with a bad disease. It's an autoimmune disease. Your immune system is ta attacking itself, its own body. It's called multiple sclerosis. All right, now multiple sclerosis is what we call a progressive autoimmune disease. It gets worse and worse and worse over time. So there were some studies in laboratory animals saying, well, if you get a worm, then maybe your multiple sclerosis wouldn't keep going as bad, right? They decided that they had about 500 patients all with multiple sclerosis. So they, in Argentina at that time, you could still get a worm by accident. So they would monitor all their 550 or so patients. When one of them got a worm, they put them in the study, and then they just grabbed another patient at random that was matched for age and you know gender and all that, and they put them in the study. It's called a control because you want to know what happens to the people that got a worm and what happens to the people that didn't get a worm, right? So what you can see here is that, and I'm going to use my little laser pointer, this is how bad the disease is. So an uncolonized means they don't have a worm. So this is what ha normally happens with multiple sclerosis over a period of five years. It keeps getting worse and worse and worse. But all the people that got a worm <laughs> You see, there was 12 people in the study, they didn't get any worse. Now, I brought some worms with me here today, but these are what we call benign worms. They don't cause problems, but th this, the worms that were acquired in this study, some of these worms were not very nice worms. So four of these patients eventually had to get their worms removed because they caused such stomach problems. I was just talking with another fellow earlier today. He said, oh, I had a worm once, and oh, I had to get it out. It was just horrible. So some of these people, the worms were so bad, they had to get their worms taken out, and then their multiple sclerosis comes back. So we, I, again, I brought some worms to show you. We, we want to put back in friendly worms, not just any old random worm, because if you get any old random worm, some of them can be very painful. All right? Not all worms are totally friendly, and especially for us in Western society, who our bodies have never seen a worm before, we really have to be careful about which worms we pick. Again, you can ask me questions later. So the idea is, if we want our bodies to be stable, we need to set it up so that we have what's called, it's called microbiota or microbiome in some cases. And we also need our animal life, and our, which is worms and some kinds of other organisms that are, that are more complex than just bacteria. And then our immune system, and when you put them all stable together, it doesn't fall over, it doesn't get sick. Or if you take one of those legs away, it can be a little bit more unstable. If you want further reading on this, Rob Dunn, I think uh, he's a, a lot of people around the museum know him. He's a professor at NC State University. He's got a website that talks about worms and how worms can help us. And it's very interesting reading if, you're, if you want to read the background information. And I think I have time. I'm going to go ahead and show you this slide here. 
which is a study that we did showing that if you have worms, your immune system actually does better. And let's see, how much time do I have? And I might just skip the next slide. Yeah, let's go ahead and skip over a couple of slides here. Uh, basically, the worms help tune up our, our immune system, like you would tune up a car. If we try to use modern drugs to fix the system, that's sort of like taking a really bad car and putting duct tape on it. It really doesn't fix the basic problem. Right? If you have questions about that, you're welcome to ask me about that. We write a lot about that. It's the first speaker here today, I don't know if you heard him, but a lot of science is hard and you're trying to convince people about things they don't want to hear. So that's a lot of my job, is to try to convince people that, hey, we should really think about these organisms that we've lost from our body. And you know, most of the people I'm talking with are in the field of medicine, and they would just rather use the drugs, right? Because they have them, and they're readily available, and for a lot of other reasons that I won't talk about unless you really ask me questions about it. When you compare modern medicine with worms, what you find is, and we've done a lot of what we call sociomedical studies, so we go out and just ask people. We have to find specific people who've tried worms, which is kind of cool. There's about 6,000 people in the world today that have tried worms to cure their disease. So we go out, we find them, we get approval from our ethics committee at Duke, and we ask them a lot of questions, and we ask their doctors questions, and what we find is that if we, we, we give them, in this case, questionnaires, we've looked at over a thousand cases now, more than 10% of all the humans in the world that have tried worms for therapy, and what we find is that if you ask them how effective was their medical treatment, it's like, yeah, it's okay, it's a four, but some people not very effective at all, but then if you follow my little red pointer here, you'll see that another name for a worm is a helminth. If you look in the, if you want to Google this and find it in the literature, in the scientific literature, or in a lot of the web pages, it's called a helminth. It's a TH at the end. You find that, well, actually, for a lot of things, the worms work better than, than modern medicine does. And like I said, we've published a number of these studies. There's some caveats to every single study, but if you work at something from five different angles, a lot of times you can find out a lot of information and work around the caveats. If you look at side effects, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier, if you deal with the fundamental problem that our bodies are missing worms, you tend to have less problems, less side effects, than if you just try to patch things up at the end with modern medicine. All right, uh, I'm gonna go ahead at this point, and a lot of, remember one of those factors is chronic stress. So a lot of what I like to do is blacksmithing in my spare time, that relieves chronic stress from working on this chronic problem that I work on, right? So let's go ahead now and switch over to the, uh, the pictures here so I can show you some worms. That'll just take a minute. So the idea isn't that if everybody gets a worm that we'll all be fixed and all allergies and autoimmune diseases will go away. Now we do have good evidence that worms will stop progression of multiple sclerosis and maybe Parkinson's. We've got some evidence of that. It's really hard though to get people to change their minds and start trying worms. And when we're not trying to get average people on the street to try worms, that might be dangerous and I would get in big trouble for that. No, we're trying to get studies done to test and see really how well do the worms work and what do they work on. So I'm gonna show you one, one set of data that I, I didn't show you was with inflammatory bowel disease and there's a, there's, it's called a pig whipworm. And here I have one dose a pig whipworm. It's from a company called Tanavisa. They are licensed in Thailand to produce this product as an Asian medicine. They gave me this. It's about $250 a bottle and it only lasts 10 days. Okay, so the worm doesn't live inside you very long. It lives about 10 days, so you have to take another bottle 10 days later. And, you know, sometimes the this is a typical dose. There's about 2,500 tiny little eggs in here that will hatch out into worms when you take this. 
it seems like a lot, but they're tiny. And if I open this up, you wouldn't even, it, it look a little bit cloudy. Right? And that worm has been proven to work for inflammatory bowel disease. It's proven very hard to develop commercially. They ran into problems with that, so it's still not available. Now this worm, this, if you can see it, I'll sort of move it around here. This I, this I got out of an adult rat. It's called a rat tapeworm. But people are, are using, they're not using this, they're using this species, but they're not using this exact um, stage of life of the worm. So people aren't eating worms that look like this. So this is a tiny little tapeworm. We've got a few of them here, different examples that I got from, from rats. And these are what we call benign tapeworms. They generally don't grow to adulthood in people. And one of those worms can produce enough eggs to treat thousands of people. And then we, we take the eggs and we grow them up in little grain beetles, mealworms, which are edible. And then those can be taken, the doses average around 30 per person every month, something like that. And they, they tend to have profound effects, as far as we can tell from our studies, on things like anxiety disorders and depression and anything. For about 50% of patients, it can affect something even like ADHD or behavioral problems. So it's a very interesting field of research that we're in, so trying to figure out how do we restore our immune systems and get rid of all these problems that we have. So I think that's all I've got to say right now, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. All right, so if you have any questions, raise your hands. Uh, second and third floor, you can ask questions too. You'll just have to yell over the balcony at me. If you're down here on the first floor, I'll bring you a microphone, and I see our first question. Thank you, that's very interesting. Can you tell us how does the worm uh, stop inflammation? All right, so the, the, the question I think with the microphone, everybody heard, how does the worm stop inflammation? So we like to think of it as when we lost the worms, what happened to us? And what, when we reintroduce the worms, is it bringing us back to normal? And the answer is we, we sort of know what happens when we take away the worms. So one thing is that your immune system sort of gets bored. It doesn't have anything to do. For those of you who've raised children, it's sort of like having a bored teenager around, okay? It really wants to do something, and if you don't give it something good to do, it's very likely to find something bad to do. All right, so number one is you just sort of give the body the thing to do, and it's, it's called a, we call it an evolutionary mismatch. Your body is made by evolution to want to do certain things, and then when you change everything, you can get sick. So that's one thing. Now the other thing is the worms produce a lot of molecules, and those molecules, when you take all the worms away, those molecules are missing. Those molecules help to tune up the immune system. A lot of those molecules have been studied. There's a professor at NC State who studies those to try to make a drug out of them. But what we think is that you really need the living organism in there because it's a complex system-system interaction, and if that's missing, it's hard. It's going to be hard to recapitulate that, or it's going to be hard to do that. You really need a worm is the bottom line. And then thirdly, when you have worms, it create, it's called feedback or regulatory loops that you get created. And when you take away the worms, those regulatory networks or feedback loops, they're not there. We're missing those. And of course, when you put the worms back in, then it regenerates those. Um, so a lot of the disorders that you mentioned, like autoimmune disorders, allergies, anxiety, are also in the rise in companion animals. And I've always wondered if there could be um, a loss of non-pathogenic parasites there from like increased veterinary care and prophylactic deworming, things like that. Um, do you have any thoughts on that or know if anyone's working on those questions? Yeah, so that is um, definitely a hot topic of interest for a lot of people and you're absolutely right. People are very interested in that and if you think about a lot of a lot of our companions are carnivores so they would have been eating herbivores their gut is the carnivore gut is very short but they would eat the entire herbivore so they would pick up their parasites temporarily but they basically had constantly 
herbivore parasites running through them, and of course, there's none of those in dog food or cat food. So that's what we, that's the idea behind that. Um, and then of course we have to deworm them because they live in crowded conditions just like we do now, and they'll pick up a bad worm, a heartworm or something, which can kill them. Um, we're at the same point with our domesticated animals, we have to figure out how to artificially bring back the kinds of worms that will that will help out our dogs and cats, just as we need to bring back our worms to help us out. We all think we know what inflammation is. What is inflammation? Well, okay, so I, as I mentioned before, I sort of oversimplify when your immune system goes nuts. So there's a time for your immune system to go nuts. So if you get an infection, you need something called inflammation, which is your immune system just gets aggressive and it starts, there's all different kinds of things that your immune system can do to be aggressive, to attack something, although generally our immune system spends most of its energy just to supporting normal life. It doesn't spend most of its energy attacking things, but when it does start attacking things, then that's what we call inflammation. Now, we in Western society, we have inflammation leading to disease. So this is non-productive inflammation. This is inflammation that we don't think our ancestors had. Our immune system is essentially, it's an evolutionary mismatch or an environmental mismatch of uh, like a fish out of water. We're, we've changed our environment so much that we're beginning to get sick for those five, big five reasons that I mentioned before. Um, how close or far are we from having commercially available, affordable products that we can consume that will address this problem? And are there any dietary or lifestyle type things we can that you practice personally that you could recommend, or go eat a bunch of worms tonight, or whatever? Yeah. Thanks. Right. We know that contact with the soil is probably a good thing, but at the same time, you can pick up a parasite from the soil if there's, say, been a raccoon that went by. So there's, it's not without risk if you try things on your own. There's a lot of stories about people who have gone to South America and cured their inflammatory disease of some sort. So we don't recommend that. Of course, we don't recommend that you not do that either, because you know if that's your only recourse, then um, so modern med. So I live in the field of official, I'm at a medical center, so what I can recommend is pretty much nothing that the FDA doesn't recommend. I can just tell you, so what can you do now? Uh, you know, you can eat it, you can, you can control four of those factors, right? The fifth one is hard for you to control and there's nothing to recommend. So the diet, the diet is a huge effect. Chronic stress is tremendous and we get, we get used to it. We watch so for example, if your immune system is having problems, you are not doing yourself any favors watching the news every night. So just as an example, think about a hunter-gatherer, right? They lived in a tribe of 50 to 100. So if they saw one member of their tribe die every day, their whole tribe would be gone in two months, right? So our bodies are not really adapted to see this kind of, of death and destruction that we can turn on the TV at any time and see. So that's just an example of how those other four factors, if we control those, we'll be missing our helmets a lot less. So that's, but in, in terms of what we're doing now and how long it's gonna be, there's gonna be a tipping point. Um, it's been, there's, we work on this a lot. Why is modern medicine not interested in developing these things? For example, the fecal transplant took 60 years to put into play after it was proven to work. So um, that's, you know, we think, that as we get sicker and sicker, modern medicine is going to have no choice but to back up and start dealing with root causes of disease. But when that will happen is probably going to be, it's going to be a tipping point, very hard to predict. I would say five years. But. All right, let's give him one last round of applause. Thank you.